Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today for CCL's Big Tent Climate Talks. This is a new and engaging monthly conversation that we're hosting that spotlights diverse leaders in the climate community. So at CCL, we all know that solving climate change requires a variety of policies and perspectives. So as we've mentioned on these calls, this is why we're doing work under a big tent. That includes folks from the right, from the left, and from every spot in between. And in our Big Ten Climate Talk episodes, we'll talk about with a wide variety of climate leaders from outside of CCL to learn more about how we can all work better together, and we'll kick that off today. So for starters, hi, my name is Sarah Wanis, and I am a research coordinator here on CCL's Government Affairs team in Washington, D.C., and today I'm filling in for Taylor Krauss, who is our National Partnerships and Coalition Coordinator. Taylor keeps a pulse on what other organizations are doing and finds ways that CCL can collaborate or work synergistically with them. And I hope that our session today gives you a little bit of a taste of how our DC team's conversations with staff from other organizations go. And with that, I'll introduce our guests today. So a little bit about Shayla. Uh, Shayla is a research manager at the Climate Leadership Council where she leads and coordinates research in carbon policy analysis and design. Prior to working at CLC, Shayla worked at a DC-based foreign policy think tank, and prior to that, she interned at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Energy Security, and Climate Change Program. Shayla holds a master's in international affairs with a distinction in international environmental policy from the University of California, San Diego's Global Policy and Strategy School, and she also holds a BA in international development from the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and I think that that's really awesome. And one of the reasons that I'm so excited to be talking to you today, because I also went to the University of San Diego and studied climate science and policy there for my master's. And our two programs actually overlapped a lot um, and grew to overlap more um, over the years. But Shayla, is there anything else that um, you'd like folks on this call to know about you or that I missed? Um, no, that was a really awesome introduction. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm really happy to be here under this tent with you and um, CCL citizens who are engaged. Um, I guess I would say, yeah, at the top of the hour that I'm here in my own capacity. I am not here to speak on behalf of the Climate Leadership Council, our contributors, our founding members, AFCD. Uh, so yeah, as long as people know that we can have a fun conversation and I am so excited to talk about my work and and um, yeah, our, our shared background in climate, climate policy. Wonderful. Um, and Great, we can, so we're so fortunate to have you as a guest on this month's Big Climate Talks, and we're especially fortunate to be um, speaking to someone who also recognizes the power of a well-designed carbon price to effectively reduce carbon emissions, um, who's working from a, diff a slightly different angle to help get that policy implemented. So with that, we'll transition to our conversation so I can stop doing all of the talking, um, <laughs> but also for the audience, don't worry, uh, we have saved some time at the bottom of the hour for Q&A. So for the first part, I'll be asking Shayla for her perspectives and experiences with some questions that I already have to guide the questions, but any questions that you have, throw them in the Q&A and we'll work them in towards the end. But the first thing that I wanted to know, Shayla, was just how did you get involved in the climate movement? Yeah, that's, that's a fun question because I actually didn't get involved in the climate movement until I was doing my master's in environmental policy and international environmental policy at that. And then I shrunk down to the federal level and, and sometimes um, even the hyper-local level interests me too. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, you pretty much said most of my resume in the introduction and in that, you know, I went to the, I have a master's in, in um, international, international relations with the distinction in international environmental policy. And that comes from the UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy. And um, UCSD and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, like you're saying, are just like sister institutions right next door to each other. Scripps is just a tiny bit closer to the ocean. You guys are actually on the beach practically. So I really enjoyed taking classes about um, atmospheric science there from some of your professors and learning about different ways to uh, address environmental degradation through like monetization of negative externalities, you know, like thinking about how you put a price on mangroves that are growing in the Baja Peninsula so that you can actually um, give incentive to maintain them and conserve them. And it was just really fascinating. And 
honestly, before that, I, I had a love for nature, but I didn't know how I could talk about it in concrete terms, let alone I didn't think that I could create a, a career based on it. So I fell in love with environmental economics. I fell in love with free market mechanisms. They married this kind of passion and, and pragmatism that I was searching for and didn't know I needed. Um, yeah, and I, I graduated in 2015, and so I actually was able to attend COP21 in Paris for the passing of the Paris Agreement. And I actually partnered with students from Scripps um, to talk about ocean acidification, and we manned a booth there. We were educating delegates within the convention on, on that topic, and I was sort of highlighting the policy challenges, and they were highlighting the science, and that was really the start. And after that, I just gained such an appreciation for how complex climate change is that I was totally addicted to it and trying to understand it and unpack it. And that brought me to Washington, DC, you know? So yeah, I, that's pretty much how I got there. And then I hopped around a little bit in DC and I've been with the Climate Leadership Council now for, for two years, so. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I love that there's that connection between Scripps and the GPS school um, at UCSD because it's so important that we're approaching these things both from the scientific and the practical implementation perspective, all, all of this. And I'm so glad that you brought up um, COP as well, um, the Conference of the Parties where the Paris Agreement was passed, this big center for international negotiations around climate change, um, which is another uh, overlap that we have. I also went to COP, I went to COP25 with, or um, the last COP rather, with um, yeah. uh, a partnership between Scripps and CCL helped me get there. But when you talk about your background in international policy and that bringing you into climate negotiations, that's so interesting to me because it is such a complex um, international negotiation process. What, what else did you learn at COP or do you have any other experience in that realm of the international side that you wanna share? Yeah, that's a really cool question. Um, you know, you, you know, I learned all of the tools on how to analyze policy at GPS at UCSD. And so like one of those analytical tools is learning the, the two, the two player game where you have two different constituencies, right? You have your international um, audience, and then you have your domestic constituents and creating policy that gets pulled in both of those directions at the same time is really interesting. And I think right now we're seeing that play out more than ever right because the biden administration is trying to do everything they can they're going to be releasing their nationally determined contribution um you know anytime between now and and climate day that's happening i think at the end of april uh, or earth day sorry um and it's going to be really fascinating to see what the administration can come up with based on what is actually implementable right because we have this struggle where it's really hard for us to pass a federal level policy that can actually reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in a really ambitious and efficient way. And um, right now, because we had pulled out of the Paris Agreement, you know, and had been pretty much absent for the last four years, as we re-enter into negotiations, people are going to be looking for a really credible commitment. So it's almost like our problem is twofold. Not only do on the domestic side, do we have to come up with a policy that everybody can actually get on board with, or at least enough people to actually pass it, but you also need it to be credible enough to the international audience. And you can't say, you can't you know, pull an Obama 2.0 where you say something like, well, we're gonna pass the clean power plan. And then it gets stuck in a legislate or a legal battle and then it doesn't get implemented, right? So it's, there's, there's still a lot of, um, I still pay attention to a lot of international relations, even though I work on federal policy. Thanks so much for sharing that perspective. It's super important to think about. So thank you for that. Um, and I was also curious, what projects or areas of focus does your organization work on and do you work on there? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would imagine that a lot of the people listening in would know of the Climate Leadership Council just because our policy um, packages are, are so similar, you know. The Climate Leadership Council was founded a few years ago and we were founded based on a partnership with our founding members. And these are people from the um, like various industries from the private sector. And these are people from the um, environmental community and some you know, influential leaders, individuals, and also um, some you know, really profound and 
well-known Republican statesmen. And so basically we, through that partnership have come up with four pillars, like a four pillar plan of addressing climate change through putting a price on carbon dioxide emissions, right? And having a gradually rising carbon price. That's the first pillar. Second pillar, very similar to CCL, is returning the revenue in the form of a dividend. And then the third pillar is regulatory simplification in the place of a carbon fee and dividend plan. And then last but not least, a border carbon adjustment. So as you can see, I mean, the so the Energy Innovation and Climate Change Act that you guys are behind, it's it they all it all contains very much the same ingredients as our plan. Um, but when you look a little closer, there's going to be a little bit of some differences, right? Um, but, you know, the wonkiness is in the details. Uh, we're pretty much on the same page about, about what we support. So with that said, though, I, as uh, a research manager, really focus on the details of those pillars, right? There's still a lot of research questions that remain to be answered. And I focused my time trying to answer those questions. And we, as a research team within CLC, really focus on trying to make that policy plan as implementable as possible and as ready to go, you know, like hot and ready to go when the, when the time permits. Um, so for example, you know, if, if I may like maybe illustrate an example. Of, of course, some, yeah. Cool. So. I have lately been and feel like I've forever been working on border carbon adjustments, which is that <laughs> last pillar. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people know what that entails, but maybe for the few that don't, I'll just briefly remind folks or just say that a border carbon adjustment is a mechanism that very much mirrors how a value added tax would work, right? Like if you impose a price on something domestically. When you have imports coming in, you're gonna impose that same price on imports coming into the United States. And then, and then the flip side of that is that any products that are being exported to the global market that were made in the United States and were subject to a carbon fee would actually get rebated that fee upon export so that it can um, compete on, in, on the same field, you know, on the same playing field with, with other goods. And we do that so that we don't create any carbon leakage. We don't, we address any sort of competitive issues. And we basically give ourselves the green light in order to implement this highly effective uh, market signal, that being the carbon price. Um, so that is extremely um, complicated to implement, not just because you have to account for so many goods at the border and you know, by all means, it is possible. It is it is um, based on you know expert analysis. It is compatible with WTO principles. It is administratively feasible. But I'm in the nitty gritty of proving those exact things, right? And so, you know, I look at things like what it looks like at the port. You know, what does the Customs and Border Protection have to do to enable? Um, imposing a border carbon adjustment because that 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 system doesn't exist for for embedded carbon of goods, um, and I have to ask other questions like what what agent like what offices within the Department of Commerce is going to help um, you know implement that that part of the plan, and I do a lot of nitty gritty about for example how do you know what to charge a good as it comes in into our border, right? And so you do that by looking at the carbon content of the good, you know, how much carbon emissions were emitted when making this ton of steel, for example, and then you take the amount of carbon emissions and you multiply it by the price per, car, per CO2, you know, per ton of CO2, and then you get how much, um, how much of a carbon fee that particular good is subject to at the border. Um, but that's that's easier said than done, right? Because there's a gazillion goods out there. So, you know, I focus on creating a scope, focusing on only a particular set of goods that are easily, more easily understood in terms of their carbon emissions, um, and also account for most of the carbon emissions that get imported into the United States. So actually by focusing on things like steel, cement, um, basic chemicals and other raw materials, you're capturing most of the energy intensive goods 
And I think if I'm not mistaken, if we were to implement an economy-wide price and, an, and a border adjustment, we would actually cover about 80% of the CO2 that we import and consume as US citizens. And I'll just say one more thing is that that's probably one of my favorite things about this work is that, um, or like my favorite thing about this plan is that we're shifting the, the accounting from production based to consumption based. Because right now, if you look at the nationally determined contributions, everyone's NDCs as part of the Paris Agreement, it's all about how much emissions a country produces and its plan on reducing those production emissions. But what about the developed countries, the West, you know, Western Europe, the Canada's, the United States, we produce a fair amount of CO2, but we consume a whole lot more because a lot of our goods are produced elsewhere, you know, in developing regions of the world or in China, and then and then it's brought over here and consumed here. So yeah, that's a, a bit of a tangent about what I love about <laughs> that work and like, yeah, the type of work I do. Wow, so much good stuff there. I don't even know where to start. Well, first of all, that the frame of um, shifting from a production mindset to a consumption mindset, that is really interesting and really valuable um, and a great way to think about this, especially when you talk about expanding it up into the national into the international negotiations. That stat about 80%. Um, wonder what was that one more time? It was you think believe. Yeah. So if we were to actually impose a carbon fee on the imports of the subset of goods that account for the most like energy intensive goods, just think like cement, steel, these very industrial products that are at the very top of the supply chain, basically, like the most upstream products you can think of that then get trickled down into everything that you touch and interact with and consume, a bicycle, a Barbie, like whatever. Ultimately that comes down to the plastics, the, the metals and et cetera, and the, and the primary chemicals. Um, and so if you were to charge those most upstream goods upon import, you would actually be covering 80% or around 80%, don't quote me exactly, but <laughs> a majority of the carbon emissions that we import as a country and consume. So that's a huge part of our consumption portfolio. And, and it's, you know, it's pretty incredible. Of course. And the other thing that I heard in there that I um, really resonated with me was one of the reasons that we are so dedicated to a carbon price here at Citizens Climate Lobby is because of the speed of implementation of a carbon price, as opposed to a lot of other um, approaches to addressing climate change um, as like kind of the backbone as a policy. A uh, carbon price is something that we can work most of the details out beforehand. So it's really great to hear the way you frame your work as being able to do that work up front. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 just one more thing is there's a huge currency on the international front, again, having a transparent carbon price, because it's really hard to compare the ambition of a country versus another country's. If you're not talking about price. I mean, regulation, the, the prices are hidden, and it's really hard to extrapolate exactly what level of ambition you're, you're, you're doing, you know, with, with regulations. Yeah. Great. Um, I did have another question for you, which is based in that uh, we find a lot of times there are things that people make assumptions about CCL, our Citizens Climate Lobby, that just aren't true. So I was wondering if, is there anything that people commonly assume about the Climate Leadership Council that just isn't true? I think for us, one of them is that we are you. <laughs> CCL and CLC get mixed up a lot, but um, yeah, I'll give you the opportunity. Yeah, I definitely have. I think one of my first interactions with CCL was someone coming up to me and asking me what the difference was. And I was just getting on board with the Climate Leadership Council and I thought, okay, well, who's CCL? And then I had to look you guys up. So yeah, for sure. And it doesn't help that our acronyms are the same letters <laughs> too. Um, but yeah, I thought about this question, um, you know, or I think about this question quite a bit because I get, I get people asking me about my work a lot, obviously, because people are, engaged for really obvious reasons. Everyone wants actionable items quick on how to address climate change. This is so pressing and it gets pressing every day. And uh, a lot of my friends come from the environmental community. They claim they come from the clean en energy industry. And I think that sometimes there's this inherent distrust around an organization that is supported by the oil and gas industry. Um, and they're they're totally right in their in their um, hesitancy in trusting a plan that that is you know standing next to these oil and gas majors. But I, upon closer look, there's there's mainly two things I could say to people who have 
tend to have that misunderstanding or that sort of hesitancy. And that's that one, times are changing. And I think that um, it's fair to say that at this point, most major industry players are very much aware that the decarbonization transition is happening and it's starting to happen now. We see evidence of it every day and it's just gonna ramp up and accelerate. And they need to understand where they're going to be and how they need to innovate themselves and their, and their business model to succeed in this world and in this transition. And so to have those experts at the table, have those oil majors at the table, is super valuable to us because it really it like really puts you on the ground and you get this really level-headed guidance and technical assistance from those people who have been providing the energy for us from the industrial revolution all the way up until today um, and then the other thing i would say is that i think is a bit missed upon people who have that mis misconception or just that misunderstanding is the environmental ambition of our plan, um, the Baker Schultz dividends plan would reduce emissions by 50% by 2035. And that's CO2 only. Um, and that's just such an incredible number that when you put that against other proposals that are not as fleshed out as ours, it really starts to look like this could be a really, really great way to go about solving for emission reductions, you know? Um, and, and, you know, of course, we have environmental um, organizations that are part of our founding members coalition, you know, we have Conservation International, we have World Resources Institute, we have WWF, you know, these guys wouldn't be working with us if we didn't pass the smog test, you know, no pun intended, but yeah, there's, there's definitely some, there's a lot of environmental ambition there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, for all that perspective. Um, and I was also curious, what are your thoughts on how we can best be in the climate movement together? For example, what are some ways that you think CCL can be the most helpful? Yeah, well, CCL has been incredibly helpful. I mean, you guys are this long lasting institution. You guys have been around longer than us and you do this incredible work where you engage citizens and you give them a role to play in, in creating climate policy. And that is just indispensable, I think, from this movement. And I don't think, I, I mean, I can't really imagine what it would be like without you guys. So the first thing that we, do, we should do is to just keep doing our thing, right? And um, our level of engagement slightly differs, right? Like the Climate Leadership Council reflects um, more of the marketplace and engages with our founding members, making sure that everyone's on the same page when we release our plan. Um, and um, hence our, you know, bipartisan policy roadmap. If anyone is curious, you can look that up on, on, on our website. But yeah, and with CCL engaging the individual, I think it's a really complementary um, synergy. And if, if I were to say, you know, one thing is I get really excited when I see conservative congressmen come out in support of an economy-wide carbon price, you know, when Mitt Romney comes out and says he's really considering you know, a, a fee and dividend plan. It's, it's, it just, it's really great. And, you know, if, for CCL uh, members who live in states with GOP or conservative um, congressmen, you continue to put pressure on those people because ultimately you need at least 60 votes to pass and we're not going to get there without our GOP buddies. Yeah, I'm always in awe of seeing um, a bipartisan coalition start to form um, around yeah. this topic. It's, just such a great thing to see. Um, and yeah, I love that you framed the, the two different approaches that we're taking to the same basic ideas. And ultimately we're gonna need all of them, which is exactly why we're having big tent talks like these. Yeah. Um, and I did have just one more question for me for you before we start to get to questions that everyone else on the call um, has. Um, but right now, what's at the top of your stack? What have you been reading as of late and what would you recommend to others to keep an eye on maybe? Yeah. Um, so climate related or just anything you know what whatever <laughs> <laughs> um because yeah so I'll I'll say two things one just a regular book that I just got and I'm excited about um, I actually have it here it's City of Trees and it's about the trees in Washington DC and I know this this probably only speaks to people who are actually based in Washington DC but I've just been really into native plants lately um, and native, yeah, just native native plants for, for whatever region you live in. It's really good for the flora and fauna. 
So I, I would recommend that's at the top of my reading list, but I'm adding it to mine right now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And this woman, this author, um, Melanie Chokas Bradley, she is part of, I think, closely affiliated with Casey Trees. Casey Trees is a really cool organization in, in Washington, D.C. that looks to do just that, is, is take care of our trees and um, make sure that we have a good, good amount of native species um, thriving around. So that's kind of the fun reading part. And then the maybe still fun other <laughs> reading that I've been doing a lot of is I've been really keeping track of the developments in the European Union on border carbon adjustments. So they, they're calling it shorthandedly a CBAM, which is instead of a BCA, it's a CBAM, which is a carbon border adjustment mechanism. But essentially it's the same thing or same intention. And um, the European Commission will be coming out with a, um, a sorry, a proposal for, for the design of a CBAM actually this summer. And so there's a lot going on and a lot of thinking happening on the European side of the pond about how to design such a thing. And if people are interested in learning more about that, I would guide you towards a think tank that's based in Brussels and it's called ERCST. I think that stands for European Roundtable of climate change and sustainable transition, something like that. But ERCST, they're, they're really great. And I've been keeping my thumb on them because they track incremental developments on, on, um, on what's happening in Europe. And it's fascinating to see how they're struggling and how they face some of the same research challenges as we do in our design of a BCA, but also they have a lot of unique challenges because they have uh, an ETS, you know, they have their emissions trading scheme and that actually poses some, some major challenges in terms of WTO compatibility and, and how do you translate, you know, the traded price of, of, a, of a permit to pollute under their ETS because they have a cap and trade system. I know you know that, but. Um, <laughs> They have a cap and trade system and right now they're, they're trading um, pollution permits at about 40, 40 euros um, and that price is only going to go higher. So they're really interested in adjusting, but they're having a, a hard time designing the adjustment mechanism. Great. Yeah. And definitely the definition of fun, um, our definitions of fun, we're climate nerds too. We align with that. So for sure. um, thanks for those recommendations. Yeah. Um, now to start to move into some of the questions that we've got from um, everyone joining this call today. Thank you all so much for being here and for participating in this conversation with us, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> but since you are um, such an expert on these border carbon adjustments and you've dove into that so much through your work, I can see that we're getting lots of questions about that. Um, yeah. So some of them include, um, are there existing procedures at the border that a carbon tax could tag into? Um, and how do you assess that uh, the carbon content and keep it WTO aligned? Yeah, absolutely. So there are existing, um, there's a lot of existing mechanisms right now because we have our tariff schedule. So we account for tariffs. Um, we have a huge tariff, tariff schedule and we implement that now and have been for a long time. So it's a tried and true mechanism. We're definitely taking, um, design points from that system, right? Like we define a lot of the goods that we're subjecting to a carbon fee as the NAICS code, which is the way we classify goods under our, our, our tariff schedule. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think there's plenty of precedent to, to base the design off of. And then the second question was, how do you make it WTO compatible? So that is, that is when you go through, um, I think it's article one and article two, but basically it's shorthandedly called the front door. So basically you can be WTO compatible by designing a border carbon adjustment such that it acts a lot like a, that, a value added tax. Um, as long as you're charging the same carbon fee for goods inside of the United States that you are for uh, goods that are being imported, then it is WTO compatible. Um, and then there, you know, for example, the European Union is considering doing it through Article 20 of the WTO, which is more of an environmental exception pathway, and that would require other prerequisites in order to become WTO compatible. But, you know, there's analysis on both ends, and I think people are still figuring it out. Um, 
how do you know how much to charge a good? So I could briefly say, okay, going back to my example on steel, for example. So there's generally two ways to produce steel. You can do it through a blast furnace. I think that's the older way. Um, and then you can also do it through an electric arc furnace, which is kind of a newer technology. And it's, it's uh, the dominant facility that we have, the dominant type of facility that we have in the United States. And that, that latter um, newer technology actually uses recycled steel. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of like a decision tree, right? Like you have different processes to create a material. So it depends on what processes you use. It depends on the, the inputs that you use to make. So to make that good. So in this case of steel, um, I believe you use iron ore in a blast furnace versus recycled steel in an electric arc furnace. So then you know your, your inputs. You also have processing emissions. So the actual like combustion and making of that product will cause emissions. And then you have the um, source of your power. So using electricity to power those facilities, where is that, um, where's that power coming from? Uh, you know, um, clean energy source or coal or gas or, or oil, probably not oil, but yeah. So there, there's, the thing is, is that these processes that make these really intense and energy intensive goods have reporting protocols already set in stone and carbon dioxide is just gonna be one more of those um, factors that they're gonna have to report. And in a lot of ways by reporting how, what energy you're using, you can extrapolate to how much CO2 you're emitting. So it's, it's administratively feasible when you focus on those really basic uh, products. Yeah, definitely. And in their question, they also had talked about, uh, they had also said that the best available technology seems to have downsides. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize like how different it is to assess it from the beginning rather than trying to put like some meter on at the end of the process. Um, so everything that you've been talking about there. Um, so thanks for giving us a little bit of insight into how that worked or how that could work. Yeah. Um, and also related to the border carbon adjustment, one of uh, the people joining the call mentioned that their senators worried that the border carbon adjustment and the EU CBAM might start a trade war. What thoughts do you have on that? Yeah, so uh, to extrapolate on that question, right, is who who do you, who would you be starting a trade war with? And I think the elephant in the room is China, um, because when the European Union is considering implementing a CBAM, they're actually extremely open about collaborating with the United States, or so I've heard from from their side. I'm not actually involved in any collaboration up until this point, but um, yeah, there there's there's a lot of talk and a lot of intention to collaborate on a CBAM. But for countries like China that aren't going to be implementing, you know, um, policies that are probably as ambitious as the ones that will be continue to be implemented in the European Union or knock on wood in the United States and Canada and et cetera, um, how are they going to react? And you know, that's just something that we're going to have to work with. Um, it's not an easy solution. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend like it's, it's totally un uh, avoidable, right? So you have to just fall back on, I think the principles of why you're doing what you're doing, right? Like number one is you're creating a level playing field so that you're actually charging the same carbon um, fee on goods that are produced in the United States versus goods that are made in China but consumed in the United States. And that there's nothing wrong or inherently WTO um, um, incompatible with that, right? So inherently, if you have good intentions and you design it well, there's always going to be a trade war, I think, in, in, in the sense that perhaps they will challenge it within the WTO. So I think no matter how perfect you design a BCA, you are always going to be challenged at the WTO level. But whether that's going to, you know, blow up into a, a global trade war, I don't, I honestly don't think that's going to be the case. And this, the other thing I just want to say is I want to remind people of what we talked about earlier, which is that if we don't account for all of the emissions that we're consuming, in a way, we're kind of subsidizing dirty produ produ the production overseas because as we can you know the European Union and the United States can 
continue to decarbonize its production, but a lot, most of our production is, is going, you know, is happening in China. And so that's a way that we're actually actively engaging with and taking responsibility for that. It's such an important reminder, and that's exactly why we at Citizens Climate Lobby are so dedicated to having a border carbon adjustment as a part of the policy that we support, too, um, just to make sure that we are keeping that um, level playing field. Um, so thanks for your discussion on that. Um, shifting gears a little bit back to the United States um, within the borders, um, Biden added Noah Kaufman to his climate team and his presence along with who Noah Kaufman, who speaks a lot about carbon pricing um, yeah. and his presence along with uh, carbon pricing champions, uh, Yellen and Kerry also seem to suggest that they might be including some kind of fee and dividend in the administration's legislative package to this uh, volunteer. So how likely do you think that could be? Yeah, I think that is totally evident of the continuing appetite for a carbon fee because a lot of people will say, well, right now the Biden administration doesn't seem like it wants to implement um, like a fee and dividend approach. It would rather go through clean energy standard and some other regulatory and industrial policies. And I think right now everything is on the table. And I think evidence of that is you have these really prominent cabinet members and, and members of the administration who have had a history of supporting carbon fee and dividend approach and continue to support that. Um, Janet Yellen was one of our founding members and I, and she still is, but I think um, technically inactive right now while, while she's um, at the treasury. But I think my biggest answer to that question is we're going to learn so much about what, what the appetite is in the months to come, right? Because we have the nationally determined contribution being released relatively soon. We're going to start to see whether or not the Biden administration really wants to do a push through the reconciliation process um, and push for climate policy through that process. And if, if that's the case, that has huge implications about what is possible. And then, you know, extrapolating from that, like what is actually possible that Biden can do using regulations um, versus a carbon fee and dividend approach. And I think we're going to understand that, that question so much more in the months to come. We'll just leave it there. Yeah, we are also waiting very eagerly. It's so exciting, though, to see the ball really moving on climate policy and to see um, how much of a priority it's being made and to be reasonably expecting these big things. And if I could comment on it, too, I'll just say that I'm really encouraged by seeing people like that um, with values similar to, I think, the values that both of our organizations hold um, in the White House and so close to the policymaking process because um, whatever comes out, it's going to have their influence in it, too. So it's it's nice to see experts in the process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also has the Climate Leadership Council helped introduce a carbon pricing bill into the legislature this session, or is there anything specific that you all are focusing on in the legislature? Yeah, absolutely. So we're focused on the, and we're working on the introduction of a bicameral, by policy, um, sorry, bipartisan piece of legislation uh, in this Congress. That is what we're working towards right now. And you know, behind the scenes, we're continuously working with our founding members to make that, that policy as implementable as possible and, and hashing out all the details. Great, and we'll be keeping an eye out for that as well. Let's see if I can pick one more question here. Um, this one says, could a border carbon adjustment also apply eventually to agricultural products with carbon costs, such as beef and agricultural products that increase the destruction of Amazon forests or palm oil plantations or destroy tropical forests? Real, real easy question. I threw at you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. This sort of gets at this idea that... Um, you know, the Baker Schultz Carbon Dividends Plan or the Energy Innovation and, and Carbon Dividends Act, you know, these policies, they, they can do so much, but they can't do everything. Uh, there's so many, so many environmental related issues that need our attention and need to be resolved and need to be worked on. Um, agriculture and supply chain, you know, sustainable supply chains is just one of them. You also have environmental justice issues. You have, you know, just transition issues. You have so many things that you want to focus on too. So um, I think that's a really cool question. I think, so 
right now, as it stands, like the typical scope of, of, of products that would be included in a border carbon adjustment do include primary chemicals. Primary chemicals is um, the, 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 the main inputs to making fertilizers and fertilizers are used very heavily in the agricultural department sector, I mean. And so in that sense, the agricultural sector is going to be influenced um, you know, by the, by, by the BCA being in existence. Would it expand to more complex um, goods like actually crop products and stuff like that? I think that is something to consider down the line. My, I understand the border carbon adjustment as a moving target because as goods, as we begin to decarbonize, less and less things are gonna actually um, contain carbon emissions. And so, and as we get better at it, we could probably expand our scope to include more complex goods. Um, and then as for like ensuring the sustainability and maybe like labor law and stuff like that, that might fall outside of the scope of a BCA, but anything is possible in the future, right? That is super interesting to think about from that perspective. So before we wrap it up today, is there anything else that you wanted to share, Shayla, or any other, anything else that you have to add to this, to the conversation that we've had? Um, yeah, not really. I, I just really appreciate, you know, our dialogue, Sarah, it's been really great to meet you. I didn't know you prior to this and I'm excited to stay in touch and I'm excited to, you know, remain engaged with CCL. I mean, you guys are doing incredible work and you'll probably see my face popping in and out of, you know, some events or activities. So I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's great to know that we have brilliant people like you also working in this climate change sphere. And I hope um, one day soon it will be safe for us to maybe meet up for a coffee one day um, here in I'd DC. love that. Yeah. So, but for everyone else, thank you so much for being here. We have reached about the 45 minute mark um, amidst this great conversation. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up for today. Um, just a brief reminder that you can find today's recording to share with those who couldn't join us live, um, as well as our education director, Brett Cease's email here. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback. Um, lastly, there's also the websites for both Citizens Climate Lobby and CLC. Um, so if you'd like to get more involved or active as well, you can, and there's the registration link to sign up for future months of the Big Tent Climate Talks. We will be back next month in the same, at the same time, same place, the fourth Thursday of every month at 3 p.m. Eastern or 12 p.m. Pacific. Um, and stay tuned for who will be have, will have joining us next time. So thank you one more time so much to Shayla and to all of the important work that CLC is doing. Stay safe and be well, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.